Esta charla, Nuria Raventos, nos lleva de la mano a través de otro de los proyectos del Fellowship de Verano de Data Science for Social Good en Carnegie Mellon. En este desarrollo se ha creado un sistema de intervención para anticipar crisis de salud mental en habitantes de los condados de Douglas y Johnson en el estado de Kansas y así ofrecer mejores intervenciones y salvar vidas. Ok, so today I will be presenting... Ok, I think we might be missing some top, but that's ok. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a project that we did with the Data Science for Social Good Foundation at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, you heard a project earlier from Catalina as well, and Rajid mentioned some of them this morning. Um, so it might feel a bit familiar in some ways. Um, I just wanted to quickly give credit to the other three um, fellows that were working with me, Fabian, Juan, and Victoria, and our two main mentors, Eric and Liliana, who were helping us throughout the project. So um, this project, for this project, we partnered with two uh, counties in Kansas, Johnson and Douglas County, to focus on reducing the impact of behavioral health crisis in there. Um, it's still very much in progress, so um, we're still developing the, the models, but I will show you the first iteration of results and implementation so you get an idea of the methodology that we used. Uh, can we go? Perfect, we can go to the next one as well. Um, okay, I hope you can see most of it. But um, so to give you a bit of background, in the U.S. in 2021, there were over 47,000 suicide deaths. Um, this is a one death every 11 minutes and a 4% increase compared to the uh, previous year. And that same year, we also had 106,000 um, overdose deaths uh, in the U.S., which was a 16% increase compared to 2020 and 50% increase compared to 2019. And this big increase has come mostly from opioid overdoses, which are a big issue right now in the US. Um, of course, these issues are not isolated to the United States alone. Um, countries all around the world are experiencing high levels of behavioral health crises. And so for with this project, we really wanted to see how we could use the increasing volume of public data that we have available to try and tackle these issues. So. Um, if we can go to the next one. As I said, we partnered with two counties in Kansas. This is Kansas State. Um, and the two counties over there were the ones that we were working with. One of them, Johnson County, is part of Kansas City. Um, and both counties actually have a lot of support from the population to invest more resources on behavioral health issues. So this is really what sparked this, um, this project. So currently, the two counties, each of them has a, an outreach team that works um, for behavioral health. So it works solely based on referrals right now. So basically, if there's a friend, family member, or a doctor who's worried about something, someone's health, uh, mental or behavioral, then they will let this team know and um, they will reach out to the person and offer them resources, whether it is counseling therapy, entering a detox program, whatever support they might need. Of course, all of this is voluntary and so they can decide whether they wanna take up on, on the help or not. Um, and so our goal was, first of all, to try and fill in gaps in, in this system and identify people who are at risk, who hadn't been picked up by their environment. Um, but secondly, to try and be more uh, proactive instead of just reacting to events that have happened um, when it might be too late. And so identify people early enough to anticipate this type of events and provide them with support. Um, yes. So um, these two counties are currently using a platform that brings together data from multiple public sources, including uh, mental health centers, ambulances, uh, criminal justice uh, data, and one of the, the public hospital in Douglas County as well, and other um, sources. Um, so we had all of this data. We also had some like a record linkage system that they have that goes across all these sources, linking individuals across them so we can um, you know, follow them through throughout their journey. So if we go to the next one, thank you. So the idea of this project was to really take on all of this data that we had, um, create a model that would identify um, patterns that would indicate that someone's at risk of having a crisis in the next six months um, and rank individuals according to this risk. So Johnson County, um, the, the outreach team there had a capacity to increase um, the individuals that they were reaching out to by 75, uh, Douglas County by 40. And so the idea was to give them every month the top 75 and the top 40 individuals who would be at most risk so they could um, you know, uh, get in touch with them and offer them whatever resources they, they would need. Um, so we can move on to the next one. So more specifically, 
So yeah, this was our analytical formulation. It's a bit wordy, but um, basically we were looking at on the first of every month for all individuals who had interacted with our data sources in the last year, can we identify uh, 75 individuals for Johnson County and 40 individuals for Douglas County who are at the highest risk of suffering a behavioral health crisis in the next six months to recommend for proactive outreach? So this was what we were trying to answer in our first iteration of, of the problem. So a couple of things here, um, we were focusing on making predictions of individuals who had been um, had had some sort of interaction with the system in the last year to make sure that the data was relevant and recent. Um, of course, that means that you're already leaving out a lot of people that you have no data on for the past year. So just something to, to keep in mind. Um, we also focused on making predictions for the next six months. This is actually something that the team is currently working on and testing, whether you know three months or a whole year would be provide better results. So all of these numbers are still very um, flexible and you know we're still working on, on deciding them. Um, okay, so moving on to the model development. I won't go into everything in a lot of detail. Um, I picked out a few things that I think were a bit more interesting of this project specifically. Um, but the repo is public, at least up until what we did last summer. Um, I think I have it on the last slide, so feel free to um, check it out if you want to have more detailed information. Um, OK, so moving on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, you can skip this one. Yeah, so our first question was, OK, we're talking about behavioral health crisis, but what are we really trying to predict? Um, and what you can see here is we categorized several events that we were interested in preventing, um, which included death by suicide, suicide attempts, suicidal ideation, uh, fatal and non-fatal overdoses and other mental health crises, which would include, for example, a psychotic break, schizophrenia attack, things like that. Um, so this type of events would be, for example, um, an ambulance run, a visit to the emergency room, or of course the death would, we would take from the, um, from the medical examiner's office data. Um, and so what we did is we actually created five different labels, which you can see on the side, that were different combinations of these events. Um, to decide to, we trained model on, models on all of them and then compared them to see you know, what would be most beneficial to try and predict. Um, a couple of things here, of course, you can imagine um, these events being something a lot more um, common than others. So out of our cohort that generally um, every month, it was around 200,000 individuals. Deaths, for example, we only had about 20 of suicide or overdose in the next six months. Of course, that's a lot harder to predict than all, mental, all behavioral health crises, which we had about um, 400 individuals that you know, would actually need support. And another thing I wanted to point out here, um, and it was mentioned a little bit in the previous talk, um, is that any decision that we make in this type of models can also have um, some equity consequences. And so, for example, in the US, the highest rate of suicide is amongst middle-aged white men. Um, in terms of overdose, the highest rate is amongst um, black individuals. And so even deciding what to focus on in terms of prediction is already making a decision on who we're spending resources on. Um, okay. okay, so in terms of features, we had a pretty complex system. We built about 300 features, um, but generally we can categorize them in this um, four different types. So we had some demographics, age, gender, race. We also had um, what we called interaction context um, features, which were, for example, if someone has been diagnosed of PTSD or bipolar disorder, or if someone has been flagged as being homeless at some point in time. And then we had um, two types of temporal features. So uh, the first one was uh, days since the last ambulance run, days since the last um, emergency room visit, et cetera. And the second one was counts, so for example, the number of times that someone has been um, arrested or that someone has needed an ambulance run in the last week, in the last month, in the last five years, etc. Um, to predict the urgency of this type of events or to understand you know, how imminent a crisis is, this temporality is really important. And so we really wanted to make sure that the models had a good input here um, and could figure out this, these patterns. Uh, Perfect. So in terms of uh, validation, we did a temporal validation. Um, I won't go into it into too much detail, but basically the idea was to try to reproduce how it would be implemented um, in reality. So at a particular point in time, 
train the model with all the data that you had prior to that point, and then make predictions on the following six months and validate them. Um, something important here is that we did this validation across um, a fairly long period of time. We wanted to make sure that the model that we picked was consistent over time and it wasn't just performing really well at one point and then just underperforming. Um, since you know this would be a continuous um, model that would be making using for predictions. Perfect. So in terms of models, we, we didn't just want to build a complicated machine learning model just for the sake of it. Um, if there was an easier way to get to the same results, we wanted to make sure that you know we could do that instead. Um, so also for comparison, we built two different types of baselines, which were basically what we would do if we didn't have this um, whole machine learning pipeline. So the first one was a simple feature ranker. So we picked out the features that we felt were, well, that we saw were the biggest predictors of these um, behavioral health crises and did different combinations of them to rank people according to them. Uh, the second one was what we called the high utilizer. And this was a model that was already being um, built by our partners. So we followed their lead completely here. Um, if they didn't have us, this is what we, they would implement. And so this was basically a weighted average of multiple events that they thought were predictive and important for this crisis. So uh, based on this weighted average, you would rank people, take the top 75, and you would recommend them for outreach. Um, so the models, we can go to the next slide. Oh, yes. uh, the machine learnings we implemented, and you know, I, I'm sure we're still adding more to these, but we tried some simpler logistic regressions and decision trees. Um, we tried a lot of random forests with different combinations um, to add a bit more complexity. We had so many features that we would expect, were expecting them to perform better. Um, we also tested neural networks uh, to see if this improved accuracy. We were really, interpretability and like explainability of our model was really important. We really wanted to make sure that we had um, an understanding of which features were important and what was leading to the results. And so we were, um, we would have been a lot more hesitant to choose a model like a neural network in this case, where it's a lot harder to, or um, a lot more involved to, to try and do a feature analysis. Um, we can move on to. So moving on to evaluation, um, of course, these are re the results of the first iteration, but I did want to show you the methodology especially. Um, I think it's um, a lot more complex than looking at you know, um, model evaluation in other fields. So um, I, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I did want to go through different types of analysis that we did um, to, to evaluate our models. Um, I will focus on the results of Johnson County, uh, just so I don't give you duplicate results for everything, um, but we did the same evaluation for, for the two counties. So yeah, the first thing we did was choose our best model um, for each of their labels. And the metric that we used here was precision at top K, so in our case, for Johnson County, we're looking at the precision of um, the top 75 people that we would recommend for outreach. Uh, and the idea here was that given that we have very limited resources, we can only reach out to 75 people. Uh, we do want to make sure that you know, as many of these people as possible do actually need support. Um, and, so, and then what we did was um, this precision at top K um, averaged across multiple um, months to make sure that you know we did see this consistency of the models. Um, so what we saw is that, as you can see, the best performing baseline was the high utilizer. This was actually not the case for Douglas County, but this was very consistent for Just Johnson County, interestingly. Um, and uh, in terms of the machine learning models, Random Forest performed um, generally quite well, but we did see logistic regression and decision trees coming up in, in some of the um, top performing labels as well. So on the, on the next slide, we can see the performance over time. So this is based on the models that we picked on the previous slide. Uh, you can see how they perform. And what we do see is that um, you know, generally, our models are outperforming the, the baseline. Uh, something that's um, difficult here when we're trying to compare different labels, of course, you can see that the precision for the death only, I don't know if you can see, but this is the, the bottom orange lines. Um, is a lot lower, for example, than you know, the top model, which is all behavioral health crises. Um, here, when we're looking at precision, we're looking at precision for the label that we're trying to predict. Um, and so, of course, compared to, we didn't even have 75 people every month. 
that would die of suicide or overdose over the next six months. So the precision, as you can imagine, um, was always pretty low um, compared to you know, all the events that we had when we brought together all behavioral health crises. So um, what we did to try and compare these models a bit more was really deep into, first of all, um, the individuals that we're predicting. Um, so um, here you can see um, only for one model, but we did this across models. Um, we wanted to understand what's happening to these 75 individuals that we're recommending. Um, and what you can see here is that for the next six months, this is for the potentially fatal label group. So this was a model that was trying to predict deaths and then also non-fatal overdoses and suicide attempts, so the most serious events um, in, in these two categories. And um, you can see, for example, 12 of the 75 people um, ended up needing a, uh, an ambulance run related to suicide in the next six months. 35 out of 75 needed one related to substance use. But more interestingly, in terms of other mental health crises, four, four, 24 out of 75 ended up needing um, an ambulance run related to this crisis that we weren't necessarily trying to predict for this model um, in, in the next six months. So um, you know, this really helped us have a better understanding of which models in total were performing better than others. And then our next question was, OK, so what's happening to our false positives? We have all these people that don't have a crisis in the next six months. But what about the seventh month or the eighth? Um, and so that's what we did when we expanded the timeline to the next six months, 12 months. Uh, in total, yeah, so we, you can see that the numbers do increase. For example, we go from 35 out of 75 people needing a substance use ambulance run um, to 44 out of 75. Um, now, this is only looking at people who, whether, at whether people need or not um, an ambulance run or have some other sort of um, crises. Um, but we're not looking at how many crises people are having, you know? So our label was really just a binary classification. Um, but what if we're, you know, there's a big difference if we're trying to provide support to someone who will need 50, um, who will have 50 crises, whether they relate to ambulance runs or ER visits, or if they only have one. And so our next analysis was really to understand our model in terms of our resources. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So what we did here is we took a whole year of data that we had. We made predictions every month um, as we would do when implemented and you know, took the top 75 people every month um, that we predicted to be at risk. And then for each of these individuals, we looked at all the different crises um, that or events of importance that they had over you know, the rest of the year. We aggregated all of these and um, this is the result. So, for every, each of these is a different model. Um, so for example, the second one is the potentially fatal, um, the model trying to predict potentially fatal crisis. And what we can see is that for a whole year, um, we are anticipating uh, about 400 um, drug-related events, almost the same volume of alcohol-related events, um, over 100 um, events of other uh, mental crises. And um, yeah, you can see the comparison here. So this gave us a much better understanding of you know, the resources that we're saving by implementing this type of project. So we can go on to the next one. Thank you. I, I think it's always interesting to, to see feature analysis. Um, and so here you have the top most important features. This was for one model, but generally was pretty consistent across different models. Um, the top feature that we saw a lot of times was age. Um, what we see, for example, in suicide is a lot more common amongst middle-aged populations, not so much um, for younger or older populations. So it was interesting to see this as a very um, in, important feature. Um, and the rest of them, what you see a lot is this DSL, it's the day since last. Um, so day since the last ambulance run, since the last hospital visit, um, criminal charges, etc. And so this just really shows the urgency of you know, getting to people um, early enough and when you think, you know, when you're expecting an imminent crisis. Um, an example that we were discussing yesterday, for example, is people who are, um, who come out of jail who had been previously, um, 
who had uh, previous like substance use events, then what we see is that after a few months of not having access to drugs, for example, it's a lot more likely that they have a very serious overdose when they go back to their environment and they don't have the same, their body cannot cope with the same level of um, substance use. And so um, this is just one example of how important these type of temporal variables are. And um, another thing is that this 75 people is fully based on the resources that we had at this particular point in time. Um, but the number of people that the team would be able to reach out to is likely to change over time or you know, month to month really, they might have different resources. Um, and so an analysis that we did is looking at um, precision um, on, based on the level of K. So um, of course it decreases over time, the more people we can reach out to, um, the less significant these people might be, or the harder it would be that the a high proportion of these people actually have a crisis. But this also shows that if we wanted to make sure that 70%, for example, of the, of the people we're reaching out to need support, then we could um, just contact the top 20 people. Um, so an analysis like this also helps you understand, okay, where, you know, how to choose your resources according to how well your model performs. Um, and then the last um, type of analysis that I wanted to show you, um, and apologies is a bit blurry, I think all of it has been a bit blurry at this point, um, but um, we, we did an analysis of, um, the, of this parity, how good is our model, how biased is it, um, does it perform better for some groups compared to others? Um, and here what we're interested in instead of precision is recall. So um, for a specific group of individuals, say for example for women, um, given this amount of people who actually have a crisis in the next six months, how many of them are making it to our top 75? And is this proportional to um, our other groups? Is this proportional to men? Um, and so what we can see here, this is the result of just one model um, for a specific point in time. Of course, this analysis, oh, you can see it very well. I can, I'll point it out. Um, this analysis, we did it for multiple models um, and across um, uh, a length of time. So what you can see is, well, I don't know if you can see it, but we have um, a middle um, gray circle that's male, and then we see that we're underperforming for female. And then for race, in this case, uh, the middle would be white, uh, the white population were underperforming for black individuals for the missing label. And we are performing really well actually for Native Americans in this case, um, where the volume of people is very small, so it's also um, slightly arbitrary. Uh, these results are definitely concerning. Um, the idea was to do this analysis and make sure to pick a model that um, was the least biased that we could get. Um, of course, some, we have more data on some individuals than others. Specific groups have more interactions with the system than others. And so if um, we're really struggling to get a model that's fair, then we might want to consider um, having different thresholds for different groups to make sure that we are allocating our resources in a fair way. Um, so this was it from the analysis point of view. Um, we can go to, uh, yeah, we can go on to the next one. Um, just as a quick summary. Um, this is um, what we calculated that um, our program would be able to anticipate, which was um, for a whole year, nine suicides and fatal overdoses, 11 suicides, um, suicide attempts, uh, and over 500 behavioral health ambulance runs. Um, of course, this depends on our data and you know, whether you're actually able to reach people and offer them resources. But um, just to give you an idea that, um, of the potential of this, and hopefully there's you know, more programs like this that, that help um, reduce this type of crises. Next one. Um, so just to um, let you know how, you know, the process is, how the program is doing right now, we're still in the model refinement and, and update, trying to test different, um, uh, different timings in terms of predictions, but also in terms of the people that we're including. The next step would be an observational trial period. So this would be running the model um, making predictions over the next few months and then waiting to see how well our model performs. And this is really to check that there's no data linkage, uh, leakage um, that might have affected our, our results. And then finally, ideally, we would want to implement a field trial, so do a randomized controlled trial to see whether this program is actually benefiting people or um, if we should invest resources somewhere else. Um, and very last one, I won't go, yeah, next one, thank you. Um, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, and this was a lot of it. This was mentioned in the previous 
um, presentation as well, but we did a lot of discussions on the ethical considerations or any um, equity concerns that we should take into account. Um, especially for a program like this, I think it's crucial to think of people who are at risk but might not benefit from this type of program. For example, homeless people that might be really hard to reach. Um, and just understand you know, which other ways we can find to provide them the supports um, that, that they need. Uh, and this was it from, from me. Um, sorry about all the issues. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast. But uh, I hope you find it interesting. I really enjoyed working on this project. And so I would love to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you.